All right, so thank you for the introduction. So I'm Takuro, uh, Takuro Izeguchi from the University of Tokyo. So I'm going to talk about infrared photothermal chronic phase imaging. This is what um, we've been working on recently. So our group's motivation is level-free cell measurement. So we develop various kinds of uh, measurement techniques. For example, uh, we develop a high-resolution microscopy, and this can be used for live cell imaging. And this is what we, I am talking about today. And we also developing a high-speed spectroscopy techniques. And it can be used for flow cytometry kind of things. So, so we develop various kinds of techniques, spectroscopy, various kinds of spectroscopy techniques, microscopy techniques, and laser. We also develop laser itself. And today's topic is a meeting for photosomal microscopy. So let me first acknowledge my group members, the collaborators, and the funding sources. So um, these three members have contributed to today's topics. So let's start with a, a, a virational microscopy. Let's see what kind of virational microscopy exists. And there are three kinds, a spontaneous thermal microscopy, coherent thermal microscopy, and infrared absorption microscopy. And there are pros and cons. And if you think about using those microscopes for cell measurement, um, mostly people use a, a, a spontaneous Raman and Kovir Raman microscopy because it, it, you can get a higher spatial resolution with a visible or near infrared light. But uh, not many people use the infrared absorption microscopy for cell measurement uh, because of the bad uh, spatial resolution due to the uh, longer wavelengths of light. So, but it, uh, anyways, if you use uh, uh, infrared absorption microscopy for cell measurement, you can uh, get this kind of images. So because the spatial resolution is a few micrometers and the cell size is 10 to 20 micrometers, so you cannot really resolve intracellular structure at all. But uh, since the, the information you can get from the infrared absorption is a complementary to the that of Raman scattering, it is very interesting to, to use it for cell measurement. So recently, um, many people, including us, have started developing mid infrared photosomal imaging. And here, we combine the mid infrared absorption and the visible imaging. And so that we get a higher spatial resolution determined by the visible light. And the uh, idea behind is uh, pretty simple. So we illuminate the infrared light to the sample. And if the, the molecules which is resonance to the IR light absorbs exist, then these molecules absorb the IR light and then heat uh, generated. And this temperature slight temperature change leads to the refractor index change, then we can visualize it with a visible light. So that's the uh, uh, that's a concept of this technique. And <clears throat> concerning the live cell imaging, so this uh, Professor Jason Chen's group uh, have pioneered uh, about this uh, technique. And at that time, they use a point scanning type microscope. So this is a, a, like a conventional photosomal microscope. So in that case, uh, uh, they combine the IR light and visible light and uh, collinearly forecast those light onto the sample. <clears throat> and then in the case, um, uh, they modulate the infrared light so that um, uh, when the molecules, uh, which is resonance with the IR light, exist the, on, on the focal point, then the, uh, the refract in the changes, then the diffraction of the visible light is uh, uh, modulated. So that, general, uh, that, that gives us a contrast. And this works pretty well, and, and they got a very good uh, uh, 3D image of our, of our cell. But at that time, to, to measure this image, they have to uh, scan the sample stage. So it takes very long time to measure it. So our idea is, okay, let's, let's use a wide field microscope to visualize so that we can speed up the measurement. <clears throat> so in this case, we illuminate a mid IR light in a wide field manner. And also we visualize uh, the, the, the solar image with a, a wide, wide field microscopes. 
and particularly our, uh, our uh, technique using uh, is using uh, phase uh, contrast uh, kind of imaging techniques. <clears throat> and this is the, the first demonstration we've made. Uh, so back in 2019, we, we published this paper. So here we use a phase contrast microscope. This is a commercially available uh, conventional one. And then we just put a mid ion light onto the sample uh, from a chrono cascade laser. <clears throat> it's a very simple experiment. And I show the results here. So the sample here is a silica and polystyrene beads. And this is a um, phase contrast image of silica and polystyrene beads. And here we illuminate a mid infrared light, which is uh, only resonance to silica beads, and then modulate this IR uh, light. And uh, the temporal signal behavior of silica and polysilic bees is uh, shown here. So as you can see, only the silica bees react to the metal on and off modulation. Okay, so this can be visualized as an image, and so you can see here uh, only the silica bees get signals. <clears throat> so we verify the bond selective phase contrast imaging is possible only by adding a, a metal light onto the phase contrast microscope. Um, this works well, but uh, as you know, the phase contrast microscope uh, provides an image artifact, which is called halo or shade, shade off. So you cannot really get a quantitative uh, information from this uh, imaging technique. Therefore, afterwards, uh, what we did was uh, switching uh, the microscope to the quantiphase imaging, which uh, provides us uh, very uh, uh, quantitative phase uh, imaging. So this slide shows a um, uh, basic idea of quantiphase imaging. So we're starting from a plane wave and <clears throat> illuminate this plane wave to the sample. And the sample has a, a refractive index um, distribution. So after the passing through the sample, the wave front of the light is distorted. And this is what we want to measure. And to measure this distortion, we use another plane wave, which is a reference light, and then make an inter interference, uh, uh, interferometric uh, uh, detection onto the image sensor. This is a kind of light field spatial interferometry. And uh, what you get is uh, this kind of 2D interferogram. And if you do the fully analysis, you can visualize amplitude and phase images. And this phase images is what we use here. So this is the um, schematic of our first MIP, uh, MIP infrared photosalmon uh, QPI technique. So we use a visible light uh, and illuminate onto the sample. And the sample image, uh, sample is imaged onto a grating first. And that on the grating, we get a diffracted light. And uh, we put the pinhole at the fulia plane on the zillth order diffracted light. And this works as a, a low pass filter so that we can uh, create a plane wave here. And this works as a reference light. And the first order light is go, just goes through these optics, and this works as a, a object light, and it, and this object on reference light uh, makes the interfer uh, interference pattern onto the image sensor. And then we of course uh, use a, a IR light from the QCL onto the sample. And this is the results. So the figure A shows a, a chrono phase image, just a conventional chrono phase image. And then figure C, D shows a uh, uh, meet infrared photosomal images. And for example, and we scan the uh, infrared uh, wave number. And for example, this D figure shows uh, amide two bands. So basically, we can visualize the uh, distribution of uh, proteins here. So it works pretty well. And the spatial resolution around 400 nanometers and and uh, the pulse energy we use so 100 nanometers or so. So it works, but uh, it was not sensitive enough. So the measurement time was 50 seconds per spectral point. 
So we had to average a lot. <clears throat> so I will I will discuss later how we can improve this uh, signal to noise ratio. So we also demonstrated um, 3D uh, imaging with the optical diffraction tomography techniques. <clears throat> so this is the, the concept. Um, left hand side, th this is a two dimensional digital photography. So uh, we illuminate the light and then uh, we get a scattered light from the object. And then we acquire this uh, scattered light with the objective lens. And the numerical aperture determines the the area uh, in the frequency, uh, you know, the, the the information you can get in the frequency spectrum. This is a, a Kx and a Ky, and also a Kz, K, a Kx uh, direction, you can get this kind of information. So you don't uh, get the fully, uh, you know, the, the field information in the Kz direction so that you cannot get a Z uh, section image. So to get to fill the KZ space, what you do is uh, uh, tilted illumination and multi-angled illumination. <clears throat> so if you tilt the illumination, um, you get the higher frequency contents. So this actually corresponds to the shift of the, uh, the frequency space, uh, the information you get. And then you change the uh, angle of the illumination and uh, make a multiple measurement so that you can fill the larger uh, area in the uh, frequency space. So simultaneously, you can fill the KZ space so that you can reconstruct the 3D image from that. <clears throat> so this is the schematic of our MIP ODT technique. So to change the, the illumination angle, we install the rotating wedge prism here. And by changing the, uh, the rotating this uh, prism, we can change the direction of the, uh, the beam so that we can change the angle of the illumination. And we also uh, use a, a two objectives, sandwiching the sample. And <coughs> uh, to, to, to illuminate the IR light onto the sample, we use the reflective objective here. Okay, which is NA is 0.55 or so. So this is the result. The top figure shows a 2D image and the bottom one is a uh, Z section 3D image. <clears throat> so as you can see here, uh, in the case of 2D imaging, uh, we can see a broad background. This is actually comes from the water absorption. So since the, the cell is surrounded by water, uh, you get, always get this kind of uh, uh, broad uh, water absorption background. But on the other hand, if you do the Z sectioning, uh, you, 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 uh, you can uh, avoid uh, seeing the water back, uh, absorption background so that you can uh, clearly see the intracellular structure like this. So this, uh, Z-sectioning capability is very useful for decoupling water absorption background, which is very useful for mid infrared photosomal uh, imaging. Okay, so uh, next I I'm going to talk about how we can improve the, the SNL of mid qpi technique. So it's very simple. We want to have higher SNL with large photosomal signal and low phase noise. And also we want to keep high spatial resolution and quantitative capability. So how we can do that? <clears throat> so to find a good uh, condition, so we made a thermal conduction simulation. Um, basically we, we assume a, a small object which uh, um, diameter is 500 nanometer, two micron and 10 microns. And then we illuminate IR light which is absorbed by this object. <clears throat> and we basically change the uh, pulse duration and to find the uh, uh, optimum uh, pulse duration. And the visible light is assumed to be uh, at the very edge of the uh, mid-IL pulse here. And those figures shows um, the basically the diffusion of the uh, photosomal effect. So left-hand side, this is the ratio of the width of 
the photostomal profile against the uh, object. <clears throat> so, and X axis, so the meter pulse duration. So if you elongate the meter pulse duration, <clears throat> uh, the heat diffuses, start diffusing. And particularly for a small object like a 500 nanometers, uh, it diffuses quickly. So for example, uh, one microsecond pulse duration, um, it gets uh, you know, uh, twice as large as, uh, 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 as the, the, uh, the uh, object radius. <clears throat> so, and right on side, this shows a, a normalized signal intensity. Again, so a small, small object, the signal starts saturates at a longer uh, middle pulse duration. So the conclusion of this simulation tells us <clears throat> the, it's better to use a less than 10 nanosecond pulse duration for methyl light. So- uh, uh, Excuse me, uh, three, three minutes left until the, the end of the talk. Ah, okay, only three, three minutes. minutes. Okay. Oh, right. Uh, all right, and uh, so based on that calculation, so we uh, implemented this um, uh, setup. So in this case, we used a, a Q-switch laser and we built a, a PPLN OPO. So, so we get a high uh, pulse energy and a, a short uh, uh, pulse duration. And we also use a, a, another sensor to reduce the phase noise. Because the digital holography, the dominant noise is determined by the uh, photon shot noise. <clears throat> so um, the, the better way to go is to capture more photons. So that we use a, a camera with a higher full rate capacity here and to reduce the phase noise. So to summarize this optimization, so uh, we get a much higher, 100 times higher pulse energy and a higher full rate capacity camera. And also we use a very short pulse so that we can get a high spatial resolution and the quantum, uh, to keep it, and we can keep a quantum, quantitative nature. So this is a result. And this is a single frame image with a SNL of 63. So we don't need to average to get a very clear, this clear image. And the measurement time was uh, 20 milliseconds and the frame rate is 50 frames per second. So which is uh, more than the video rate. And it can be go up to 250 frames per second because we have a very enough signal to noise ratio. And this 250 is uh, limited by the, uh, the camera's frame rate now. And of course, we can get a hyperspectral image. So we can scan the IR light and we get a spectrum. And then this is a result of multiple value curve resolution analysis. And we get the three components, lipid-like, protein-like, and water-like components like this. OK, maybe uh, so I quickly show that. So, so since we have a very um, fast measurement technique, we made an a intracellular uh, water and heavy water exchange measurement. So we put the cell in the water first, and then illuminate the IL light, which is resonance to water. So that's why we see this, uh, um, the focus spot first. And then we quickly exchange the water by heavy water. So outside the cell, you, uh, the, the signal from the water uh, disappears quickly, but the inside the cell, the water signal remains a bit. So this uh, provides us um, the how fast the water molecules go through the water channel, which is called acapulene. And it takes uh, uh, 300 milliseconds or something like this. All right, so perhaps it's time. So I skip this uh, spatial resolution things. And yeah, this is summary. So we developed the first uh, meeting for uh, phase contrast microscopy. And then we developed a uh, uh, infrared for some quantiphase imaging. And we made a live cell imaging and a video rate uh, uh, imaging with an improved signal to noise ratio. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Itiguchi. Um, and um, why the, 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 the 
questions, or I, I, I think I can ask you one question myself. So uh, you, you showed this nice sectioning of, the, of, of a cell, for example. So what was the resolution uh, along the Z direction? Uh, and, and I mean, is it, is it what you expect from uh, uh, diffraction limits? Oh yes, so I think what you mean was like like this. Yes, uh, here for example. Right? Yes, 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 yes. Um, so the spatial resolution uh, was in this case like a, like a two hundred nanometer or something, oh, and right. the in G direction like uh, two micrometer or something like this. Right. So so yeah. in keeping with the 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 yeah the, the numerical aperture of your optics and uh, yes exactly and for the I so the, the the phase retrieval is uh, conserves the resolution uh, properly mm -hmm. and uh, i didn't have time to go go through but uh, so recently we made a, a new technique and uh, which is you know aiming for higher spatial resolution and the latest one is like this so we use the high numerical aperture 1.2 and wavelengths of 532 and we've got <clears throat> Um, if you use the Nikes Shannon criterion, 120 nanometer, and if you evaluate it with a FWHM or point step function, 175 nanometer or so. And you can actually improve if you use a NA of 1.49 and wavelengths of 400 nanometer, then it can go, you know, below 100 nanometer or so. So it's kind of very promising way. So. Yeah, indeed, very impressive. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Are there questions? I, I I didn't look at the chat. I see one question in the chat. Uh, no, that's from uh, Subazis. So please. I think Frank had a question because he. Yeah, uh, Frank, please uh, ask your question. Yes. I, I, yeah, I thought, thank you very much for the talk. I thought I can ask myself. Um, uh, if I understand right, then <clears throat> the optimum pulse width for the excitation and also. Uh, for the detection would depend on the size of the uh, feature you're detecting. So mm -hmm. do you weight different feature sizes differently by, by applying this um, technique? Yeah, so as you said, so it depends on the size of the object. And yeah, this stuff shows that. So for example, fiber nanometer, it's very quickly diffuses. So mm -hmm. we have to use a very short pulse, like uh, less than 10 nanosecond. Mm -hmm. And if your object is larger, like a 10 micrometer, so it's it's okay with a one microsecond pulse duration. Okay. Yeah. But would you gain something from uh, taking several images with variable pulse length and maybe also delay at the end? This is all for delay zero, of course. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so this calculation is a delay is zero. And of course, so if you make a delay, larger delay between the meter and visible pulse. Mm -hmm. Of course, during that time, the heat uh, diffuses. So you always lose spatial resolution uh, and the signal intensity. So it's the best way is, uh, is to cool mm -hmm. right after the IL heating. Yes. Thank you. All right, there is another question by Suvazis Adikari. Yeah, I have a very uh, basic question. So if I look at your amplitude image and phase image, and I see the quite good contrast in phase image compared to amplitude image, um, is it because of your measurements are in the cell where it's limiting the amplitude image or can it be used for normal without cell for material science, then still, uh, still the amplitude image will be sensitive enough or what is limiting this amplitude image compared to phase image? Um, so the reason why we use a phase image is because the the what what changes is a refractive index, right? So due to the, the photosomal effect, the refractive index changes. So the refracting index change can be very sensitively measured by the phase shift. So that's why we use a, a um, the phase image rather than the amplitude image. And of course, if the temperature changes, the amplitude also slightly changes, I guess. So this can be used as a contrast, I guess. Yeah, so, but for cell, you know, the biological cell is almost a transparent. So it's, 
it's better to go for a face image. Okay, so, I have a very good, quick question. Maybe, maybe maybe we can move to the next question because okay, the, yes. the time runs yeah, on. Thanks. So, so the next uh, ne the last question of the session is by our next speaker, Chelung Xie. Uh, please, uh, Chelung, ask your question yourself uh, there to the speaker. All right. So my question is. Uh, on the difference between face imaging and refractive index imaging, as you show both results in the presentation, especially mm -hmm. if one wants to estimate the density of lipids, for example, mm -hmm. which one is more accurate and which one is easier for quantification? Um, yeah, so refractive index can be um, can be can get only when we visualize a 3D image, right? So from the 2D image, you can only get a phase shift. The phase shift is uh, determined by the refractive index times the length. So yeah, the better way to go for is uh, always a refractive index measurement. But yeah, only with a 2D image. The, the phase shift also tells us some, you know, some information. So, yeah, so that's the difference. So, but, but to convert that refractive index change to number of molecules, mm -hmm. uh, is, is there a way or is, is there a way to do this convert? Yeah. Um, so refractive Is it linear? Index, well, yeah. So people say, oh, it's almost re linear. So it, it not, uh, refractive index is is proportional to the, the density. So, yeah, so we haven't really investigated the, the counting the, the number of molecules, but um, yeah, so at least the literature says it's almost linear, yeah. I see, thank you. 